Bears fans, number 89, the Colts, Mike Denka. These are the best fans in the world. And I thank you so much for your support. And go Bears! That was a special day, and it happened right here at Soldier Field. Hi, I'm Mike Ditka. I know many of you come here today because the Bears play here, but there's a lot more to Soldier Field than football. It's a place dedicated to history's real heroes, the men and women of America's military who gave their lives for our freedom. And it's a place that's made a lot of history itself. Here on this great field, a field dedicated to the American soldier. This broadcast feature which has come to you from Soldier Field in Chicago. Soldier Field in Chicago. Debut is at Soldier Field. Here from Soldier Field in Chicago. The world is literally watching Chicago this afternoon. So I welcome all who have come. They've come to Soldier Field to cheer. There's something magic about it. Soldier Field in Chicago. At the turn of the century, Chicago was a sprawling city with big dreams and big plans, especially for a piece of soggy landfill just south of the brand new Field Museum. City leaders wanted to build a memorial to the nation's fallen soldiers, the largest sports stadium ever constructed, with a massive tower that would dominate the city skyline. There was going to be something that looked like a combination of the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Monument. It was going to be the Lincoln Memorial with the Washington Monument on top of it. The giant tower was never built, but the classical colonnades rose quickly on the lakefront. For Chicagoans, they would become the real memorial. The horseshoe-shaped stadium, designed by architects Holabird and Roche, would become the heart of the city's civic, sporting, and cultural life. From the start, Soldier Field was a home for football especially Notre Dame, the Fighting Irish, who played here while their stadium was under construction. But it was the Army-Navy game of 1926 that established it as a premier symbol of pride and patriotism. It was tremendously expensive to bring in thousands of cadets and all of the people associated with having this iconic game in Chicago. It was hugely ambitious, and of course they pulled it off. Chicago picked up the tab and rolled out the red carpet, hosting cadets and midshipmen at a Drake Hotel dinner dance with six jazz bands and 3,500 young women recruited as hostesses. On game day, despite freezing temperatures, more than 100,000 jammed the stadium. Millions more listened to the nationwide radio broadcast. The game ended in a tie, assuring Navy the national championship. But the real winner was Soldier Field, suddenly catapulted into the ranks of the nation's most sought-after venues. From that day on, if it was big, it was at Soldier Field. The stadium soon became Chicago's gathering place. It hosted amateur sports, from track and field to ski jumping. Athletes came from across the Midwest in the 20s to climb a 200-foot high snow-covered slope that towered over the colonnades, all for a few moments of airborne glory. There were also rodeos, <laughs> auto racing, and motorcycle thrill shows. Something new in Motomania they do is at Soldier's Field. Some had trouble with the name, referring to it as Soldiers rather than Soldier Field but there was no mistaking its place in history. For Chicagoans, it's always been a very patriotic place, with war shows that reenacted famous battles and showcased America's military might. Crowds cheered our troops at I Am an American rallies. In 1927, the legendary Long Count title bout again drew the national spotlight. The Dempsey-Tunney fight probably is the single most historic heavyweight championship ever. 145,000 watched champ Gene Tunney in the white trunks defend his title against challenger Jack Dempsey, who, by all rights, should have won the fight with this powerful blow in the seventh round. He landed what everybody in sports views as maybe the greatest left hook ever thrown. Watch it again in slow motion. Tunney goes down, dazed, with Dempsey hovering over him, 
apparently forgetting the new rule that you couldn't start the 10 count until the standing fighter was in a neutral corner. Five long seconds elapsed before referee Dave Barry began counting, giving Tunney a full 14 seconds to recover. Five extra seconds to an athlete like Gene Tunney, who was superbly conditioned, is a, a time of recovery that is highly significant. The infamous long count gave Tunney time to regain control and retain his title by unanimous decision, assuring Soldier Field still another place in sports history. But sports were only part of the picture. A year earlier, in 1926, the Roman Catholic Eucharistic Congress drew perhaps the largest crowd ever in Chicago. One million people gathered before a giant altar on the field and spilled outside the stadium walls, with a choir of 62,000 schoolchildren celebrating the Mass of the Angels. In later years, there were annual Easter services and giant youth rallies, often featuring a dynamic young preacher named Billy Graham. When Charles Lindbergh flew the Spirit of St. Louis to Chicago, he received a hero's welcome at Soldier Field. President Harry Truman visited three times. In the pursuit of peace, there is no single path. Truman, just one of a collection of household names who visited, played, performed, and prayed at Soldier Field, a who's who of 20th century American history. Not every event ran smoothly. A battle of the bands almost turned into a battle with police when 100,000 teenagers descended on Soldier Field, leading to the infamous Jitterbug Riot. Well before the doors were supposed to open, the gates at Soldier Field were mobbed. The stadium filled to capacity, at least the police thought so, and so they closed the, the doors of the stadium, but there were so many kids that they pushed their way into the stadium, and then they overwhelmed the field, and then there were stages set up, and they overwhelmed the stages. Music at Soldier Field played almost as big a role as sport, and showcased the biggest stars of the day, from John Philip Sousa and Liberace, to Duke Ellington and Johnny Cash. Soldier's Field is now the background for the world's greatest festival of music. Men and women from all walks of life have come to take part in this glorious pageant of music and song. Long before American Idol, Musicians competed in local talent contests for a chance to appear. It, it must have been absolutely tremendous. I mean, to perform there, you would feel like you've really made it big. And that tradition of flicking on cigarette lighters at rock concerts? The match lighting ceremony has become a tradition of the music festival. Decades before they did it at Woodstock in upstate New York, Soldier Field audiences struck matches and held them aloft. The flickering flame even became the festival's logo. During the 50s and 60s, the stadium hosted the Pan American Games, Mayor Richard J. Daley's annual prep bowl for Chicago's high school championship, and the original Special Olympics, which was founded at Soldier Field. There were daring police department thrill shows and fire department demonstrations where buildings were actually built on the field and then torched to show firefighting prowess. But it wasn't all fun and games. In 1964, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., given free use of the field by the Park District, also made history here. The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., head of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, is principal speaker. Nearly 70,000 gathered to cheer his arrival. Many believe this event established Chicago as a key battleground in the civil rights struggle. But while Dr. King may have sparked the start of a new era of activism here, it was nearly the end of an era for the longtime landmark. Time was taking a toll on what Chicago newspapers began calling the white elephant by the lake. Yet Soldier Field refused to die. Big name entertainers helped keep it alive. Journey was the opening act for the Rolling Stones in 1978. 
40,000 people rushed the field when the gates opened, some so far away they could barely see the stage. Mammoth rock concerts became a soldier field tradition that continues to this day, sharing center stage with Bears football. As Papa Bear himself, George Hallis, became Soldier Field's main tenant in 1971. Four years later, the Bears drafted one of the greatest running backs of all time. Chicago Bears, first round selection, Walter Payton. Payton was soon to be coached by a Chicago legend whose leadership eclipsed even his formidable talent as a Hall of Fame player. All you got to do is want it as much as we know we want it. We don't want it that much. There was an atmosphere here at Soldier Field that I have not really seen in sports anyplace else. We would see our defense, the greatest defense ever assembled, come in and absolutely crush the Packers and the Vikings. Let's go, baby. Let's go. Rock it now. Rock it. Bears fans didn't care that Soldier Field was old or cold. Players didn't either. When I look back and, and I think about the sack that I got right here, about on the 40, 30 yard line, and we were saying that it was going to be a lot of snow, and the snow didn't come until after we got that sack and after we got that touchdown. And I can just remember watching Fridge wave his hands up in the air and that big gap in his mouth, and, and the fans wearing gloves so you can't hear them, but you you hear this roar. In 1986, the team brought home its first Super Bowl. I told the team when I got the job, I said, we're going to win a Super Bowl here. And I said, uh, that's the good news, the bad news, a lot of you guys won't be here. And I said, and I wasn't trying to be cruel, I was trying to be factual, because there's a price you have to pay to be successful in life. And were we willing to pay that price? We were. We had a great group of guys. Suddenly, Discussion about Soldier Field's demise was replaced by debate about restoring its splendor. George Hallis never lived to see the new stadium he wanted so badly. But in 2002, construction began on a new stadium for a new century, with the old colonnades and the name Soldier Field, the only reminders of the past, sacrificing hundreds of millions of dollars in naming rights revenue in the spirit of respect and patriotism. It's great for Chicago, it's great for the veterans, it, every, everybody wins, including the Bears. Just inside the south entrance to Soldier Field, the Bears commissioned and unveiled a statue of a World War I soldier. And on Veterans Day 2003, the city dedicated a new bronze relief at the north entrance, depicting modern-day members of the armed forces and their families against the Chicago skyline, bearing silent witness to history and its true heroes. The town is Chicago, and the winds blow sharp. And so whether it's hockey played in a blizzard on an ice rink on the 50-yard line. Yeah! Or a fundraiser that'll make life better for children across Illinois. Or world leaders gathering on a balmy spring night in a president's hometown on the field where he cheered his beloved bears. If it's big, they still come to Soldier Field. Well, when I first came to Chicago, first place I ever stepped was on field was here. We came down here, I was, I was a draft pick and it was in March or April, and the weather was pretty good, so we're out here throwing the football around. Now, that, at that time, the seat, I think it seat 110 or 20,000, and the stadium was, it was a coliseum is what it was. So what they have done here is tremendous. I mean, what the city has done with the uh, Soldier Field is really something special. Glad you're here. Enjoy your visit. Go Bears!
Go Bears! <laughs> yes. Do one of those. Let's do another one of those. And action, Eli. Go Bears! <laughs> oh. Mr. Hallis heard that. Yeah. <laughs>